Everybody, this is Pastor Brian. I'm a pastor here at Cherry Grove Church of the Nazarene. Thanks for being here with us today. 
Uh, whether you're watching on Facebook Live or you're uh, checking us out on our website, watching it live or checking us out on the replay, uh, we're just thankful that you're here with us this morning, uh, coming to church with us. We're not just about Sunday morning as well. We have Sunday school uh, before church and we have small groups that meet through the week. We also have Wednesday night Bible study at 6.30 and our teens meet then. You can see all that in our announcements and on the website and Facebook page. Give us a shout out. Let us know. Hey, if you're new here, by the way, uh, put a comment in the comment section. Let us know uh, that you're here and we're thankful we can have you here with us today. But it's getting time to start for church. So grab your Bible and let's go to church. Thanks for being here with us. Welcome to Cherry Grove. We're glad you're worshiping with us. And if you're a visitor, first time, we're glad you're here. Um, and if you're a regular member, we're definitely glad you're here too. Let's all stand and worship up and singing together. I just feel like something good is about to happen. <laughs> Oh, I just feel like something good is about to happen. I just feel like something good is on its way. He has promised that he'd open all of heaven. And brother, it could happen any day. When God's people humble themselves and call on Jesus. And they look to heaven expecting as they pray. I just feel like something good is about to happen And brother, this could be that very day I have learned in all that happens just to praise Him For I know He's working all things for my good Every tear I shed is worth all the investment For I know He'll see me through, He said He would he has promised I know we can hardly fathom All the things he has in store for those who pray I just feel like something good is about to happen And brother, this could be that very day oh, I just feel like something good is about to happen I just feel like something good is on its way he has promised that he'd open all of heaven And brother, it could happen any day When God's people humble themselves and call on Jesus And they look to heaven expecting as they pray I just feel like something good is about to happen And brother, this could be that very day Yes, I've noticed all the bad news in the paper And it seems like things are blinker every day But for this child of God, it makes no difference Because it's bound to get better either way Oh, I've never been more thrilled about tomorrow Sunshine's always bursting through the skies of gray I just feel like something good is about to happen And 
brother, this could be that very day. Yes, I feel like something good is about to happen. I just feel like something good is on its way. He has promised that he'd open all of heaven. And brother, it could happen any day. When God's people humble themselves to call on Jesus, and they look to heaven expecting as they pray, I just feel like something good is about to happen. And brother, this could be, sister, this could be, brother, this could be that very day. Amen. If you weren't awake, you should be awake now. Call upon the Lord. It's a new one we sang last week. I'm going to try it again this week. We need no other hiding place. Our hope is safe within your name. This we know. This we know. You promise never to forsake. What you began, you will sustain. This we know. This we know. I will call upon the Lord, for He alone is strong enough to save. Rise, your shackles are no more, for Jesus Christ has broken every chain. All of the heavens and the earth announce the fullness of your word. This we know, this we know. And every enemy will flee as we declare victory this we know this we know I will call upon the Lord for he alone is strong enough to save rise your shackles are no more for Jesus Christ has broken every chain. Yeah, I will call upon the Lord, for He alone is strong enough to save. Rise, your shackles are no more, for Jesus Christ has broken every chain.
can take our shackles away and we can just give it all to him no matter what we're going through. In Proverbs 31 ministries it says, these days have been long, haven't they? Our bodies are tired, our hearts are weary, and our minds are exhausted. We didn't plan for this year to look the way it does. And we didn't see any of this coming and yet we find ourselves waking up each day to a world that doesn't feel quite normal. And as we continue to walk this path that feels so uncertain, our spirits carry the weight. We desperately long for the day when life feels secure and normal. But church, we can't give up yet. God is working things out in the middle of our mess. Romans 3, 5, 3 through 5 says, We can rejoice too when we run into the problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. This verse tells us that we will face trials. But when we do, we can rejoice because we know God is working. He's building endurance, strength of character, and confident hope in us. God is growing our faith in ways we can't see yet or fully understand. The next time you find yourself feeling the heaviness of the past few months, take a moment to pause, to breathe in, to breathe out, and remind yourself that God is working. Declare it with us today, church. God is working in the middle of this mess that we're in. truth older than the ages there is a promise of things of yet to come there is one born for our salvation Jesus there is a light that overwhelms the dark Chains that bind us, Jesus, Jesus, who walks on the water, who speaks to the sea, who stands in the fire beside me, who roars like the lion, who glares. Yo 
is the name we call on for all of our cares. We don't have to call on one God for something and something else. You are our Savior. You're our Redeemer. You're our Healer. You're everything to us. And we thank you, Jesus, right now for the power that's in your name, the angel that told Mary, you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Thank you for doing that. Thank you for being who you are. We stand right here in this moment in your house. In, on the Sabbath day, getting ready to open your words, we sing songs to you from our heart. And I pray we've done that. And I pray you've gotten honor and glory and worship from all that we've done all throughout this week. Not only what we do here in this building for you, but it's also what we do every day. And so I pray you'd help us right now to reach out to your big hand and just ask for strength. Thank you for what we've accomplished throughout this week, but now that we have a new week ahead with a whole bucket load of other things and challenges to deal with. And so we just ask you to help us do that this morning. And then, God, now I pray that as we enter into this service and as we uh, continue to worship and learn and hear from you, that our ears would be open, that our hearts would be soft. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good to see each one of you here today. Um, as we look into the Word today, we're going to look into the book of James, first of all. But as we talk about... Um, the things of, of going on around us all the time. I don't have to tell you at all. Thank you for singing what you did today, though, uh, Angie, at that last, the last course just to sing Jesus. There is something about that name and what, 
who he is and uh, what he has done for us. It's not a, not a byword. It's not just something we pull out of the back of the car when we have trouble. He is our all in all. Amen? I hope he is for you as well. And so thank you for uh, making it your choice to be here today. And uh, there's just a special sense of the Holy Spirit right here in the room this morning. I, I look around, though, for our country. Or I'm sad for our country. I'm, my heart breaks for what people are going through right now. Uh, one of the signs of, of having empathy Pat is usually though okay even if I'm not going through it it doesn't mean I don't care and I see people with uh, lots of lots of problems that go on in their world right now and it, it, it led me to um, just listen to the Lord for what he would have me say today and a lot of you know, listen I'm probably not going to read anything you haven't heard before but obviously if you read your Bible it's going to be kind of hard for you to hear not hear something you haven't heard before right I love when JC comes to me after church I had what you read highlighted in my Bible I'm like so the carnal side of me wants to try to find something she doesn't have highlighted in her Bible uh, I don't think that's going to work but I love you you're, you're fantastic thank you um, and so when you get down to the really root of the problem what is the problem the problem is not yeah people don't like each other people don't like political parties they don't like this they don't like that we don't like things that go on uh, and that's fine I'm, I'm here to tell you I don't really care about anything other than your heart you know if your heart is pure and you love Jesus I love everybody you love everybody there's nobody I don't love I don't care what planet you're from I don't care uh, race doesn't I don't care uh, any of that stuff I could go down the whole list Dan I love everybody I really do there are people that may not understand uh, things about us at times as the church but it doesn't give us a right to be mean to people or slander or say things that, that happen out like that I love everybody do you love everybody I hope so Lucy does, man, I, don't, I hope, I think she's listening to me. Some of you guys, I think you're slipping transistor radios in these uh, things you got over here listening to something else, but somebody's doing some good preaching somewhere, so that's good. Um, so look at, your, look at somebody across the room and just ask, do I love them? You know, this side, this side look over here and this side look over there. And I don't mean the person you were talking to before church either. You know, look around the room and say, do I really love uh, Herb? I love you. I appreciate you, man. You're, you're growing in their faith and he's here. Uh, thank you for the, the privilege of getting to baptize you the other Sunday. Brett, I don't have your certificate again today. Guys, I'm the worst at remembering stuff like that. But we had witnesses and we know it happened, right? But I love you. I've been praying for you forever. Dustin bought me a wonderful lunch this week. Had a great talk. And by the way, you want to get on my good side, just buy me lunch. Or take me out golfing, right? Mike, Mike took me out golfing uh, this week. And I, I don't know if I won or not, but I know my back is killing me. That's all I know. Uh, we got to ride in Paula's cart, though. Let me tell you what. Everybody needs to get on Paul Norman's golf cart for just one day. It sits 11 feet off the ground. It's got tires this big with ruts in it. You could climb Everest in that thing. It gets serious XM radio, and there's a, was there, there's a, never mind. But anyway, it's huge. It goes really good. Thank you for allowing Riff Raff to ride in your, in your cart this week. Are you enjoying life? I hope so. It's too short for us not to enjoy it. And the problem today that I get down to for myself is this, that I enjoy life, but I always have to remember, Rex, that I still am a fallible piece of clay who needs Jesus. And if I ever get to the point that I think I am above needing Jesus, Daniel, then I have got a bigger problem than just whatever else I think is going on in my life, the root cause. We have to get to the root cause of the problem. James, one of my favorite books in the Bible, deals with everything very methodically and very plainly and very to the point. You ever want to learn about how to control your tongue and how to learn about sin, how to learn about life in general, hope, just read the book of James. It doesn't take you very long. And in these verses today, uh, James 1, 12 through 15, verse, verse 12 says this in James 1, Blessed is the man or the woman who remains steadfast under trial. That means you don't blow your top when things aren't going right. You keep yourself on an even keel. But he says, for when he has stood the test, he will receive a crown of life, which God has promised to those that love him. Anybody in line for that? That sounds pretty good to me, doesn't it, you? In line for the crown of life. In line to receive good things from God. Amen? To know that if we stay steadfast and, and faithful and true to the best of our ability, Tom, we're going to get a crown of life on these days. Amen? And I, 
I've said this before. I don't care if I'm the greeter at the door, Bryce Rop, of heaven, as long as I get there. And that's exactly what I'm about. I don't even, I don't need a mansion. Uh, we talked about heaven in my small group last week. I just want to get there. Being homeless in heaven wouldn't be a bad thing. Amen. Streets are made of gold. <laughs> that's all right with me. But he says, now he says, okay, stay in steadfast for trial, but let's address the fact that there are trials, Mike. And he says, let no one say when he's tempted that I'm being tempted by God. God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. It would make no sense, Gloria, for him to send his son to cleanse me from sin and then use that to tempt me to fail. God doesn't do that, Terry. What God does is walks with us through the fire that we just sang. He takes care of us in the midst of that to keep us from doing the things that we shouldn't do. Amen? But let no one say when he's tempted. But... Now, this is exactly what we're going to follow through today. Each person is tempted when he's lured and enticed by his own desire. And desire, King James says lust. So I stayed away from that on purpose because I don't want you just to hear the word lust. I know where everybody's mind goes. And it's not just that sexual sin is the only sin in the world. There's a boatload of sin in the world. There's a whole lot of stuff that God would classify probably as sin if we're not careful. And the reason I say that is to keep us all honest to say, at least I don't do that, <laughs> right? At least I don't do that. Hey, that dude over there does way worse than me. Stop looking at what everybody else is doing and just make sure you and God are right, amen? amen. And so when he says that you're lured by your own desire, and desire can look a lot of ways, and I use this example a quadrillion times. If quadrillion is a number, and it is now. Anybody goes on a diet, anybody trying to watch uh, watch their weight and I keep talking about that all the time and I know I do that a lot because me and food have had a relationship for a long time and I don't see it stopping anytime soon okay so I'm watching what I eat and I'm at work and all of a sudden old Chase sits down and he's got exactly the food for his lunch that I'm not allowed to eat for this month I'm looking at him thinking be all right if a meteor struck right now right on top of his head right you get upset it seems like that every time we set out to do right that evil is present hey by the way there's bible for that evil is present brock we don't have to look very far to find evil anywhere at all and so if you want to try to figure out why am i the way i am as paul said what i should do i don't and what i don't do is what i should do i'm with you there's not a soul walking the earth jim that doesn't get that concept he says here's what happens let me let me break it down for you as james would say you're tempted when you're lured and enticed by your own desire and then in verse 15 it goes on to say when desire is conceived it gives birth to what and then sin when that's fully grown lovely big flower bush full of tulips that everybody wants to smell and pick right absolutely not it brings forth the death death gets to the bottom part of the whole thing now thank you Brian I got out in the, on a dreary day already and I came to church and you're depressing me to death hold on I'm not trying to depress you I'm trying to help you we're pulling weeds anybody pull weeds anybody like to pull weeds and stuff you got a garden or you got a house or you got stuff like that um, you know I, I make fun of the middle section out there somebody asked me no that is really not pot growing in between the church here and the set back there that is not that's just what I say to make you laugh unless you want to go out there and find out then you got a bigger problem than wondering what's out there I see a lot of you eating Doritos and brownies this week. I know that thing probably got taken care of this week. But that's not what's out there. And I got other people. That'll hit the side over here just in a second probably. That, I got people volunteering to clean that up this week. Get a go bubba for that. Amen? Now that you're thoroughly out of whack with that, let me say this. So now when we look at how things go progressively that would look a lot better you know what we can do i use that as an example all the time because i don't know how many people said man we gotta do something about that <laughs> yeah we should the teens went out there and cleaned it up last year here's the problem if you don't get to the root of what's going on you can just you can chop the heads off of everything all day long but if you don't pull the roots out what happens and don't don't take my last name for granted i can't grow i'm lucky i can grow this i can't grow a thing out of the ground whatsoever but if you don't get the roots up it's going to continue to pop up and that's what we have. That's what we have in life. Remember when they didn't love Joseph, their brother, anymore? What did they do with him, Toby? They said, this dude keeps dreaming these dreams and making us look bad. Here's what we'll do. We'll throw him in a hole. 
and they buried him. Well, if you, if you plant good stuff, good stuff's just going to come out. And then they looked at him down there, and they said, that's not going to work because he's just going to start screaming, and Dad might hear him, and we're going to look bad. And so the, the, the Egyptians came by, and what they do? They sold him to them, and they thought, good, now he's out of our way. The problem was, Josh, they didn't take care of the problem, and the favor of God followed Joseph. And before it was all said and done, to make a very long story short, he grows in favor after some bumps on the road that he had to run away from the traps of Satan. And Joseph stood before them in a famine in the land, and they had to go to Egypt to get food. And their brother that they threw in a hole and sold had their fate in his hand, Ray, to feed their families. He would be the one that would decide if they got food to go back home with or not. Don't you love reading that story? Because you read the words when they go, and they realized it was Joseph. And you can imagine they're all looking around going, well, this is done. <laughs> We're doomed. Joseph proved to be a godly man and went back and wept when he realized it was his brothers and they came out and took care of them and fared very well. If you don't, in that case, it worked out in their favor, so don't, don't use that one on me. But they thought they had a problem. They thought they took care of it. You've got to take care of the sin in your life. I don't mean explain it away. I don't mean uh, qualify it. I don't mean make excuses for it. I'm talking about get down and dirty, get in the muck, pull the root out, cut its head off like David did with Goliath. Remember that? Kev, he went up there and he hit Goliath between the eyes with the rock and he was already gone. This is great lunchtime fodder to discuss. But Pastor Wolf, he went up, what did he go up to Goliath? Did he go up to Goliath and go, yep, I think he's dead. No, he put his foot in his chest, cut his head off and stood over top of him holding his head up in the air and said, this is what happens to people that blaspheme God. Well, sawed off four foot David, Right? took care of it please do not cut the head off of people that you don't like this week but you can cut the head off of sin desire when it's conceived gives birth to sin and sin was fully born fully grown brings forth death here's the root cause a root cause is a fundamental great and i didn't make this up i know you think i can this could come from my genius mind thank goodness for the interweb can i get a go bubba for that right a root cause is a fundamental underlying system-related reason why an incident occurred that identifies one or more correctable system failures. All right, Teresa, that means something's wrong, and we got to figure out why it's wrong. Something went awry. Something's not working right here, Tom, and so we got to figure out what the problem is. But it says, I love the part that says, correctable system failures. Listen to me clearly this morning. Sin is correctable. Sin does not have to run rampant in your life. Sin does not have to hold you hostage faith in what you do and in how you think and in the way you manipulate around it. But Brian, it's all around us. Sin lies at the door. Wherever good is, evil is present. I know. That's why we have to learn how to handle it. If we don't, it's going to handle us. So he says it can identify a correctable system failure. A root cause analysis allows you to discover the underlying or systemic problem rather than a generalized or immediate cause of an incident. In other words, they come to you, Craig, and they say, well, you know, this, this thing over here that we did, this survey, it's not right. Well, why is it not right? It's not right. And they walk away and leave you sitting there. What do you mean it's not right? I know it's not right. I need to know why it's not right. Why is this not working right? Somebody brings something back. Uh, they bring back materials to you, Mike, and they say, well, we don't like this. Well, why? Well, these boards are crooked. Well, do we know why they're crooked? Yeah, they're crooked. I, we sometimes just major on what's wrong. I can tell you what's wrong. That's why I didn't want to go into detail of talking about things around us that we know are wrong. We just need to get to the root problem of that and figure out why it's wrong. And so here's what we have to do. We have to get to the root cause. And I can tell you this much. We don't have a problem in this country that can't be traced back to sin. Amen? If, if people don't love each other and they don't like you because of your skin color or your background or what state you're from or your college you went to or your parents, that's not anything other than a sin problem because God did not say any of that was okay. Amen? If they don't like you because... Uh, I remember when my brother lived in Tennessee and we went down there and there are still some people there that call you a Yankee. You know, I never liked the Yankees. We hate the Yankees. I'm an Indians fan, you know, and 
I don't like the Yankees. Don't call me one. But I realized what a Yankee was. And so we went down there, and uh, when my brother was living there, when, they, when he was going to college, and they were at their church, great people down there. But uh, one guy looked at me, he said, so you're a Yankee, huh? And I'm like, oh, man, if I hear Sweet Home Alabama playing, I might be in trouble over this side, right? But he was kind of kidding, but he was kind of not. And then after a while, we went down there a few more times, and the same guy, he said, yeah, you know, for a Yankee, you're all right. I'm like, okay, maybe I'm all right, <laughs> you know? You get labeled. We label each other for stupid reasons. We label things that we don't like before we even know why we don't like it. We have a problem. And sometimes, and most of the time, and really, if we're honest, it can still be traced back to sin. Brian, I don't believe you. All right, let's rewind the tape all the way back to the very beginning. Genesis 3. I've taken this chapter into three different blocks now, and I don't want to keep you here till 3 o'clock, but I want you to understand. If, if sin... And the, the way that it progresses to get to the root cause of it is the fact that first it starts with desire. And so your desire is stirred up for something that you're not supposed to have in some way, shape, or form, right? And so if that's the beginning, read verse 1. The serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field. Hello. That means the serpent's coming after us. And it says, he said to the woman. Who's the woman? Eve. Only woman in the world at that time. Did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Now, okay, there's two chapters before this one, but you know what happens before this, right? God said, I want you to picture as many fruit-bearing trees as your eyes can see, Beth. Just picture it right now. Take a deep breath. Humor me for a minute. You know, take your teeth out. Lean your head back. Take a deep breath. Oh, look at all these trees. Every fruit you can imagine. I'm talking at fruit you, you can't even pronounce is in this huge garden that goes on for miles and miles and miles and miles and miles. Almost as much land as, as uh, Rodney Norman owns over on 20 Mile. And there's trees with fruit all around you. And what did God say? You can have all of this, except that little one all the way over there. It's going to take you weeks to get to, and you're going to need... You know, Ray Nixon to take you on a tractor and Bryce to drop you out of a helicopter and three or four people with guns to get you there because it's heavily got That one little stinking tiny tree way over there, don't touch it. But you can have, if I do it again, I'll probably throw up, but you can have all of these other trees. Am I making my point? And you know what they realized at that moment? Satan said, I got something to throw at him now. Did God really say, what's he giving them? He's giving them a partial truth, isn't he? That's how Satan starts with a desire. God did not say that they couldn't eat of any tree of the garden. He said you could eat of all of them but one. So what was, what was Eve's answer in verse 2? Here's how the desire begins to get rolled in. The woman said to the serpent, well, we can eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. Sure. She probably did that twirl like I did right there. But God said you can't eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you even touch it lest you die. So she remembered. That should be enough right there for at least an A minus, right? We have a hard time remembering, oh, I forgot, right? Oh, I forgot to do it. And listen, I forget to do plenty of things. But sometimes we look and say, why didn't you do that? I forgot. At least we're honest. Sometimes we can throw that I forgot out there, though, to try to remember, hey, I just didn't want to. The serpent said to the woman, you're not going to die. Don't ever get to the point that you believe Satan over God. Because now the desire, Holly, has become something more of a battle of who do you believe? And there's times I think that we believe what Satan says only because we like what he says more than what God says. Yeah, but I want that. Because now that it's forbidden, that's what I want. Every time you tell your kids, don't touch that. Every week I make fun of my son. Connor, it's the only thing I'm going to talk about you today right here. Because the last couple of weeks I know it's been like, Dad. But I remember, if you look at Connor and say, hey, don't touch that. I remember seeing him. We were, we were out to eat once, and he was looking, and I was trying. I said, Connor, I want to talk to you about something. And he kept looking, and he was going like this. You know, his eyes were like, but his hand was going this way. I can remember weird little stuff like that. So it's like, I don't want you to touch that. Okay, and I'm talking, and he, he was going, he didn't think I could see him. I'm like, I could see your hand. Just couldn't help it. By nature, we just want what we can't have. Amen? Satan knows that. And so what's he telling Eve? You're not going to die. God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. That is true. He's not lying there. Or he's telling them the truth. Sometimes Satan can make the truth even sound better. But it was for their protection. 
kids in the room, when mom and dad say no, they're not trying to ruin your life. Mom and dad never, I mean, maybe some of you parents are, but I don't think you ever get up and say, how can I ruin my kid's life today? <laughs> right? I mean, Ray probably has said that a time or two, but Tony's almost, it. maybe we should just have an altar call right now for the parents that have thought that. I've thought it, but I've just never said it, okay? But God's not doing that either. No isn't, I'm going to ruin your life. No is because that's not good for you. That's going to lead to trouble. You're going to end up with more trouble than you need right now. So for Pete's sake, go the other way. And they didn't. So here she looks, and it starts, the desire starts to churn that James talks about. And so now Satan's got her because he's making her realize God's holding you back. God's trying to keep you from becoming all you can be, which is hogwash. Amen? God did not create us to hold us back. God created us so we could flourish and, and get to our purpose in life. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, he never said that the tree they couldn't touch was ugly. He just said, don't touch it. When she looked at it, and she thought, man, that is shiny fruit. And hey, that doesn't, I wonder, hmm. And the closer you get to it, the better it looks. Then you realize, Tom, hey, I'm within a foot, and I'm still here. My liver's not hanging out. So she took the tree, and she took off the fruit in verse 6, and ate she realized it was good. She took a bite. Can I be, can I just be legalistic for a second? It wasn't an apple. It might have been, but I don't see anywhere in anybody. You can pick up every version you want. I don't see any other version, and maybe there is one that says it's an apple. That's just something we all thought. Eve got the apple. She got a piece of fruit. My luck, it was probably a pear. I don't like pears. Anybody like pears? It would make sense because if you ate a pear and got in trouble, that would make sense because pears just don't have a, I'm weird, but I don't like them. If it was a coconut, I'd really be mad. She also, Stan, get this. She turned. So apparently Adam must have been close by, or at worst, she took the long trip back to where she started. She said, Adam, you got to eat this. Then he said, where'd you get that from? I don't recognize it anywhere. No, this is awesome. You got to take a bite too. If he was beside her and she handed it to him or she went to him, for whatever reason, Adam didn't ask any questions and just took a bite too. What happens in verse 7? The eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. In that first group of pictures, of, of verses, you see the exact progression James talks about. Desire starts to lure us away, and as we swim in the desire long enough before you jump out, it leads to S-I-N. And now we're right smack in the middle of it, and now here's what happens. Now their relationship with God becomes affected because Here's what happens in verse 8. Now, and get this scene. As beautiful as this scene is, it says there's other places that said God would come down in the cool of the day and talk with them. That's how much he loved Adam and Eve. He loved the relationship with them. It said he would come down, and in the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day, he wanted to come down and, and have, have conversation. What a relationship to have with the Almighty that he would come down and want to sit down and talk with you. Hey, he still does that today. We just have all kinds of excuses why we don't want to sit down and listen with him amen god comes down and he's looking for them and he's trying to find them here in verse 8 and says uh, and he realized the man and his wife had hid themselves from the presence of the lord among the trees of the garden here's what sin does now that we're in the middle of this progression james talks about all sin does is put a separation between us and god and now that relationship was all right here comes god we get to talk to him today now it's He's coming, and I'm not where I've got to go hide. And now it's broken. Listen, church, it can be fixed, though. But it's sad that it can't be what it should be because of sin. Amen? Verse 9 says, But God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? One of the most interesting verses in the whole Bible, I think. You think God knew where Adam was? I mean, yeah. Well, why would he ask, Where is he? Because here's how we get to the other side of sin without facing the death God just wants me to come out and come clean he wants me to come to him you don't have to wait for the atom bomb to drop on your head right Craig if I'm out there and I've sinned and now I'm ashamed and God knows that and God's coming looking for me Carolyn he says where are you at we need to talk let's fix this and I keep running because I'm ashamed and that shame it, it can be pure shame it's okay 
But he comes searching saying, hey, you don't have to keep hiding. Let's talk about it. Let's work it out. Where are you? God knew where they were. That's the grace of God right there in Genesis 3.9, I think, Brock. He says, hey, come to me. All ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Verse 10, they come clean. He said, hey, well, Adam says, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. That's as close to a confession as you're going to get out of the boy. God says, oh, psh, who told you you were naked? Now we get to the bottom of it. Have you eaten of the tree? I command you not to eat. Man, I don't want to answer this one. You know when you're busted? I'm not talking to anybody in the room that ever got busted for anything because you're all angels, right? No one's ever done anything wrong in their whole life. I told them uh, in the early service today, uh, my brother and I, anybody remember, this is how old I am. I can remember when Nerf footballs first came out. Can anybody remember when the Nerf footballs came out? And my brother and I, this is how I know that my mom is not of this earth. I know moms have hearing that can hear from here to other planets. Every mom in the world said that's right. And it doesn't get any worse. As older I get, it gets better. We were in our room. We had a Nerf football. We got it, and my brother said out loud, yeah, we can play with this in the house because it's Nerf. 8,000 miles across from the room where we were, my mom was in the kitchen, and she says, no, you're not. And we looked at each other, and I go, you dummy, could you shut up? Don't talk so loud. He goes, I was whispering. Mom said, no, you're not. Not long after that, Beavis and, and, and Dummy over here, me and my brother, nobody's home. And guess what we're playing with, kids? Hey, in this episode of Neither One of Us Have a Brain, we're playing with a football in the house. And he has Marvin Hagler hands, hands of stone, and I threw a perfect tight spiral. Mike, it was the best throw I ever threw in my life from the kitchen to the living room. And that dummy, it popped out of his hands, and it was going so hard, it was a harder kind of nerve. It hit mom's vase of a flower pot on the one side and it sent we could never get lucky enough to either obliterate something or just chip it we would always do stuff that was right down the middle of we're going to die or we have the way to fix it but we got to be intelligent enough to fix it well we're dead we got super glue that was also invented the day after nerf footballs were invented and right down the middle of it wherever the crack was we put super glue on there and then we turned it facing the other way mom won't know what side of the vase the whole stupid thing looks the same all the way around and we turned it backwards and we thought, <laughs> we're smart. We played catch some more. Put it away. Three days later, mom's over there watering a plant. We forgot about that water goes in a plant. And this is why I knew my brother needed glasses. He missed the crack over there by like eight miles. I'm not even sure he took the cap off. She poured water, and water's starting to seep out of the thing, and we're looking at it, and I'm looking at him, and I'm like, yep, you might as well just get your hands ready right here. She looks up, she goes, huh, there's a crack in this thing. I go, what, his head? She goes, no, this vase right here. She kind of knew. She goes, I wonder why it was turning the other way around. I'm like, uh. <laughs> yeah, we got to see the light of day, actually probably right before the day he got married, I would think, you know. We found out. When you do what you're not supposed to do, it just leads to a complete line of junk in your life. Just come clean. You know what would have been better? Now, at my old age, would have come home. I would have, now, if I had a phone, here's how I would do I would text mom. You guys with text have the great ability to send the float salvo in the air to find out if you're going to die or not, right? That would have been, a, I would have killed to have that when I was a kid. No, I had to sit there and wait till they came home, and it always took them three years to come home. I would say, hey, mom, broke your vase. Love you, but we did the dishes. You know? Who told you you were naked? Come clean. So here's Adam's chance to come clean before we get to the death part. What's he say? Man, I would not suggest this coming out of your mouth at any point in time. That woman <laughs> that you gave me, your fault, you gave her to me, not me. I didn't pick her. Want anybody else to choose from? I had one. That woman you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit. But the last three words is really all he had to say and I ate yeah you did it's your fault so they're all standing here in the line I always picture this it's almost like everybody's in trouble so God's looking at Adam going just as I figured you're going to blame somebody else you know what else sin causes you to do it's not my fault you gave it to me you took it <laughs> not my fault nobody likes me yeah they do have you ever heard more excuses in your life in our culture today why 
things are wrong. It's not my fault. Not my fault. Maybe it's not always your fault, but at some point in time, it is your fault. Amen. That's good preaching right there, by the way, those of you that are listening. What's the, what's the woman say? Ladies, you're not spotless. He looks at the woman, what is it that you have done? And the woman said, at least she has Satan to blame. The serpent deceived me. Let's get to the heart of it, though. And I ate. That's my tweet of the day. And I ate. And I ate. They're both guilty. They ate. And so now we get down to the serpent. And he looks at the serpent. God versus Satan. We all know who's winning this battle right here. He says, because you've done this, cursed you are above all livestock and the beasts of the field, and on your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And this is the interesting part of this verse that I keep talking about. He puts him on his belly. That must mean that snakes were walking upright. I'm kind of glad this happened because that would freak me out to see a snake walking around like this. They freak me out slithering around the ground like they are all the time, right? The snake goes down. So yes, we can all blame Satan for sure because he is the root of all evil. He is the one that causes all sin. Amen? He is the one. But you don't stinking have to listen to his lies. And it's not this one's fault and it's not that one's fault. They may have given it to you. Anytime I've ever done something I didn't need to do, yes, someone gave it to me, but I took it and I did it. So I can blame them if I want or I can just say I made a bad decision. Here's the great part of that. God says, again, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Sin causes us to blame. Sin causes separation from God. Sin causes us to scramble around and try to cover our tracks. The Lord said to the serpent, verse 15, I'll put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head. The offspring of the woman is going to end up being who? Jesus and you shall bruise his heel. You know what that says? Satan, you might have got a little victory here right now. Here's my favorite part. I want you to do this all week long. Tom, it means this. The serpent came along, and he says, You'll bru he'll bruise your head. You'll just bruise his heel. The offspring of her, the lineage coming from this lady, is going to put you out. Amen? I could do that all day long, man. Boom. It's just going to bruise his heel. It might put you out, but it's just going to be one more thing for him to move on. He's going to redeem these people because they're going to need a redeemer. And it's going to flatten you. So nice try, and it worked this time. But I'm going to have plenty of people that aren't going to fall prey to your junk. Amen? I thought by now you'd be hanging from the lights at least a little bit. But then we get to this last part, 16 through 19. 16 says, he still looks at the woman. We still are paying for sin. I'm going to multiply your pain in childbirth. I'm sorry, ladies. And in pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. We'll just keep going. Because you've listened to the voice of your wife, Adam, and have eaten of the tree, I command you not. Curse is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it will bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. In other words, we're going to have to work now. I was going to take care of everything for you, but now we have to work. By the sweat of your face you'll eat bread till you return to the ground. Out of it you were taken, for a dust you are, and the dust you shall return. We pay for sin. We're still paying for Adam and Eve's sin. So it makes me wonder. I don't want anybody paying for mine. Do you? I don't want to leave a legacy of mistakes and sin and junk behind. I need freedom from sin. If only someone would do something to free us from the heavy debt and weight of sin. Oh, wait, they have. His name is Jesus. Man, you didn't even know today, did you? You didn't even know. We've sung about our Redeemer. And I want to look at Romans before we close. Romans has the antidote to that. Man, I love Romans 6 1. What shall we say then? Should we continue in sin so grace would abound? The disciples that asked Jesus, Lord, they said, This forgiveness stuff feels awesome. Woo! It is so good to tell Jesus we're sorry and be cleansed. We can jump up and down. This is great. Can we just keep sinning and coming back? I'm going to run over here. I know what I, I'm going to come back and woo-hoo-hoo. -hoo. Jesus said, no, man. If you think forgiveness is great feeling, and it is, you should try fellowship and relationship with me. Woo-hoo. Anybody got a woo-hoo in you? 
I can do it for all of us if you want. <laughs> Sometimes it feels pretty good just to let one out. It didn't sound right either, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Here's what he says in verse 2. By no means. And this is Paul. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Thank you, good night. He's not saying, I'm just going to give you a little antidote, and it's going to, I can free you from it. We're a holiness church. We believe in being sanctified and being cleansed. Doesn't mean that we're never going to sin, but it can mean the farther and the closer we get to God, Pastor Wolf, the better and more we want to please him, and that same junk doesn't have to keep multiplying and occurring in our lives. There's freedom. Amen? Later in Romans, in this same chapter, in verse 12 through 15, he says, Let not sin reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present it to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. That means quit walking around in fear that you might sin. What's that mean? I can just walk around and do whatever I want? Yeah, that's what I said. No! It means don't get up today and go, okay, God, I'm, I'm going to try it. I'm going to put my foot out there. Oh, I don't think I can do it. That's me trying to learn how to swim. No! Tracy, can I tell your story real quick? I had a birthday this week, right? 21. Bless your heart. Found out two, yeah, you're, yeah, you're welcome. The, two weeks ago, Found out you weren't going to be able to have a job. You lost your job. So she's like, okay, God. And what would have been really easy for Tracy to do is get down in the mouth and, and talk about it. This is what we do. When we get upset, we tell everybody but the person we have the problem with. So she could have had a problem with everything in the world and run around and done stuff. But instead, she prayed. She put a prayer request out. She said, just ask God to help find me a job uh, before whatever has to happen. Got a job this week in her field, teaching, online teaching. She's got a job. You know why? She didn't go, well, I've been burned now. I'm just going to go in the corner and be bitter. No, she said, I'm going to put my faith into actions and see what God's going to do. Present your life as an instrument for righteousness. Give it a chance to let God do something fantastic. Amen? Guess what? He will. But we can't live in the fear that sin. Sin is all around. Wherever good is, evil is present. Well, that doesn't mean we have to tiptoe around and afraid. We've got the power that rose Jesus from the dead in our heart. We can have victory over that if we allow it. Amen? He says, and your members to God as members of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you're not under the law, but you're under grace. And then he says, are we to sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? By no means. As they come with an invitational song, whatever God's led on their heart to close with today. Let me, let me share this with you. Sin does not have to have dominion over us obviously because of Jesus' blood, but the progression that James shows should hopefully get to our, our hearts and become to a part in our lives where the triggers and the flags can come up. So Shelly to say, all right, I know that's a trap of Satan. That didn't just pop up out of the blue. This thought came from somewhere. This opportunity, huh, wonder if he's throwing that out there at me then. This, the setting was just right for me to open my mouth all kinds of stuff. And let me just say, let me go back to what I said earlier at the risk of being thrown out in the middle. You know, it's not just the outward stuff that's a sin either. You thought I was going to let that go, did you? Sin, there's not just like five things, Patty, that are wrong. There's a bucket load of stuff. Now, I'm not saying, okay, there's the minefield, so I got to walk between everything. Here's what you do. You get up every morning, you say, God, let the words of my mouth, meditation of my uh, lips be pleasing in thy sight, O Lord, my God, and my Redeemer. I need to be used, Terry. I need to, when, you go to, when you go to work and you bless the people you work with, they're going to watch how you react. They're going to watch how you carry on. They're going to watch the things that you do because you're a daughter of God. You love him. You're trying your best. And there's everything that we do. We've got to remember, what am I harboring in my mind? I am never going to be able to have to go down when I pray at night, Mike, and I'm going to start telling God, okay, God, you know what happened today, but just hear my side. <laughs> this is where I'm coming from. Here's why I did what I did. And I start going through the progression of all it. And God's looking at me going, I know. I knew what you were doing when you did it. I knew your motive. You don't have to explain anything to me. He already knows. He knew what Adam and Eve were going to say. So it can really help your prayer life 
And Dan, it can really help us in our decision-making to not, when it comes to sin, to stop acting like God doesn't see us. That's actually a benefit. Well, I can remember sometime somebody come up to me, I was a young preacher, and they said, you know, I'm just not real comfortable thinking that God can see everything that I do. And I wasn't a big mouth like I am now. I just looked at him and I said, well, okay, well, I'll pray for you for that. What I should have said was, then, man, you need to turn around and get back to the altar because I'm glad that God can see. There's many times that knowing that God is watching glory, everything that I do has kept me where I need to be. But knowing that, when I step in a hole and twist my ankle, God, I'm sorry, I ate it. Just pray that prayer this week. Would you practice that? Just tell him, I ate it. I did it. Sorry. I, I wish I hadn't. Help me. You know why? Romans 6, 22 and 23. Take these verses with you. But now that you've been set free from sin, have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. Now you're not bearing sinful fruit anymore. Everybody that's ever got a sucker, a sticker, a stuffed animal, or a candy bar in church or in Sunday school, Jenny knows Romans 6, 23. Say it with me. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Do you believe that? If you continue in that progression James talks about, yeah, there's death. But if you turn course and receive the gift of God, and even as a child of God, receive forgiveness, there's eternal life. That's what we're after. Amen? Not after trying to make people feel worse. After trying to offer them the joy of knowing we have freedom of forgiveness in Christ. And sin does not have to have dominion over us. But to rewind all the way back as you stand together for just a moment. All the way back to the beginning again. Let me say, the root cause, the problem, the issues in our country, the issues in our lives, the issues of what we're dealing with as a culture is not anything else other than S-I-N. It's sin. And the way to fix that, obviously pray. Pray for all those in leadership. Pray for everybody that, that you can't have a direct control with. But it starts inside of each one of us to pull that root and try to get better. Amen? Jesus, we love you. As we get to the bottom of what's happening in our lives, we get to the bottom of what's wrong and trying to be the right representation of you everywhere that we go. We have to handle and deal with sin in a million ways. But God, I pray right now that you would help us all to remember to get to the bottom of it quicker each time. When sin does spring up in our lives, when there's things that we need forgiveness for, don't make, help us not to wait forever to ask for the forgiveness. Help us not to wait. Help us have a relationship so strong with you that we can take care of it quick and pull that root out, and pull that so it doesn't have a chance to grow. The better we get at that, the more we'll do it. And God, we don't want sin to reign. We want, man, I wish everybody in the world obviously knew who you were and was a child of God. But I also know how powerful your spirit is. And I pray you would move amongst your people to be representatives of that even better. Then I pray you would get a hold of those that maybe still haven't given their heart over to you yet. And sin is their dominant force in their lives and they need it rid of it. Speak to them even now on how to get to the root of it and remove it. Help us see it as it develops in our lives and move it away. Thank you for our church. Every precious person in this room right now has a purpose, has a soul, has meaning and value. And I pray you would speak to them individually. Help them come and pray for whatever may be on their heart. And maybe it's to uproot some stuff. And I know you'll bless them for that. In Jesus' name, amen.
that's drawing near when this darkness breaks to light and the shadows disappear and my faith shall be my eyes oh jesus has overcome and the grave is overwhelmed the victory is won he is risen from the dead and i will remember there's coming a day this will all be over amen can't wait for that day to come pastor wolf is going to close us in prayer uh today want to make a couple announcements my small group is going to meet tomorrow not tuesday tomorrow night uh have something tuesday night so i want to make that announcement i thought it was going to be i had to get my schedule corrected so tomorrow night uh is my small group and then bible study and youth group is wednesday night 6 30 here then you see uh, out on the tables out there and I know you saw it posted on Facebook remember the three numbers 930 1020 1050 uh, starting on the 13th of September that's just in two Sundays uh, and this little sheet will explain it I, I'll, I'll talk forever and then you'll be more confused but uh, the nine the nine o'clock service is going to get moved to 930 and then we'll have uh, and that will pr pretty much just be the sermon there'll be uh, some announcements at first and then we'll have a closing song altar call song with that and then that leads into a time of worship from 1020 to 1050. There'll be worship music as people go from that one. And then the other people start coming in. The online service will start at 1040. And then 11 o'clock will start at 1050, 10 minutes earlier, starting two weeks from today on the 13th uh, as a way to start bridging to get back into one service again. Uh, still kind of uh, getting ready to go into that. But that's what we're going to do for the time being. So. The board, we talked about that two weeks ago and hashed over. Listen, it was a long meeting trying to figure out exactly what to do. I, let, me, let me just reiterate to you right now with this. I don't think anyone really understands what exactly to do half the time, especially with all the things that have been thrown at us. So all we're trying to do is uh, do the best we can to make sure everybody is safe, but all as well still offer uh, worship times and, and help it all to flow as much, but also without wearing everybody out in the process. Uh, so that's the, the plan for that for right now. I'm sure there's plenty of people that are like, I don't like it. You're, you're more, it's a free country. You're allowed not to like it. Just do me this much favor. Give it a shot. 
Uh, I didn't know I didn't like broccoli till I put it in my mouth once. And then I put cheese on it, and it was even better. So give it a shot. But also, please do this. Don't talk to 11 other people and then smile at me. If you got some questions about it, I'm a big boy. I, I'm not going to fall apart. I'm not made of porcelain. I can handle questions or thoughts about it. That would be fine. The worst thing we can do over service times is allow it to become some kind of issue. It's not going to become an issue. I'm just telling you that right now. It's not going to be one. This is how we're going to go with it for a while. We're going to try it and go with it through there and just pray for us, smile, because one day we will rise, and we won't be in this old sin curse, virus, polluted, opinionated world. We'll be in a much better place, but we're not there yet, and we're all trying to get there the best way we know how. Amen? And so uh, that's where we're at, but make sure you take that home with you, look it over, and be prayerful, and uh, figure out exactly what direction you want to go with that. Okay? Pastor Wolf, great man of God, we love you to death. That sounds bad when you say you love somebody to death because it makes you kind of scared, doesn't it? I, well, you're fine. God bless you. I don't know about you, but it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Last time I was in service, I was holding it down in Florida, and they shut us down. We have a privilege. I would like to say Christian lives matter. And you are the light of the world. That's what the scripture says. We are the light. And if people are in darkness, and they are in darkness today, we are the light. And people watch and see how the church responds. It's our job to pray. It's our job to brag on our Christ. It is our job to make a difference. And we will make a difference, Christians. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you are the light. This world is full of darkness, but you are the light. It says a light that is on a hill, even though it's a candle, you can't hide it. I pray, Lord, this morning for each one that's here. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to worship. It's a privilege. It's our opportunity, it is our day to glorify you in all that we do, in all that we say. Be with each Christian that's here this morning. And Lord, we also know that there are those that are here that may not know you or may not be walking as close to you as possible. We pray, Lord, that thou would just draw them in and encourage them. We read in the 23rd Psalm, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Lord, all across our country today, people are walking in the shadow of death. The scripture goes on to say, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thank you, Lord, for that. Be with each one of us. Lord, bless our lives, bless our ministry, because each one of us have a ministry if we know you as our personal Savior. Go with us now, dismiss us with thy blessing. Bring us back again that we may worship together in the house of the Lord. Amen.